Hello, good morning, good afternoon to our audience joining us from various time zones. I'm Raymond Karam, the Chief Program and Development Officer here at AGSIW. Uh, today's program is titled Tehran and Washington, Back to the Nuclear Deal and Beyond, and is part of our ongoing coverage of U.S.-Iran relations, the return to negotiations over Iran's nuclear program, uh, and repercussions for the region. I'm happy to introduce a really stellar panel of experts joining us today, starting with our good friend, Ragida Dragam. Uh, Ragida is the founder and executive chairman of the Beirut Institute and is a columnist for The National. Previously, she served as columnist, senior diplomatic, diplomatic correspondent and New York bureau chief for the London-based Al Hayat for 28 years. She was a political analyst for NBC, MSNBC, among others, and has contributed to The New York Times, The Washington Post, and Newsweek. And if, also I may, with us. if I may add also, I'm uh, in Arabic, I'm columnist for Al Nahar Al Arabi. I yeah, take pride no. in being a columnist for an Arabic uh, newspaper. So it's uh, Al Nahar Al Arabi. Just, Thank you, Ragida, for adding that. Yeah. Also with us is uh, Suzanne DiMaggio, Senior Fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where she focuses on US foreign policy toward the Middle East and Asia. She is one of the foremost experts and practitioners of diplomatic dialogues with countries that have limited or no official relations with the US, especially Iran and North Korea. Before joining Carnegie, she was a senior fellow at New America, the vice president uh, of global policy programs at the Asia Society, among uh, other distinguished postings. Uh, last but not least, uh, Ali Vayez, who is uh, Crisis Group's Iran project director and senior advisor to the president of Crisis Group. Uh, he led Crisis Group's efforts in helping uh, to bridge the gaps between Iran and the P5 plus one uh, that led to the landmark 2015 nuclear deal. Previously, he served as a senior political affairs officer at the UN Department of Political and uh, Peacebuilding Affairs and was the Iran Project Director of the Federation for Ameri of American Scientists. Moderating today's session is Hussein Ebish, a senior resident scholar here at AGSIW. He's also a weekly columnist for Bloomberg and the National UAE. And with that, Hussein, over to you. Thank you so much, Raymond. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, this is a, it couldn't be a more important topic, even though uh, you know a lot of attention is focused on uh, Gaza. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit because it's not unconnected. Uh, but of course, today what we're going to focus on uh, is the U.S.-Iran negotiations, the re reengagement uh, in Vienna, even if indirectly, and efforts to revive the JCPOA nuclear deal from uh, 2015 and to see what can be done to go beyond it because um you know it's obviously that's uh, that's going to be the beginning of the conversation it's not exactly an end in itself in my view so i'm really happy to have this amazing panel with us today i mean it's just wonderful so thank you all for joining us uh what we're going to do is we're going to have a conversation uh sort of informal but i'll be asking questions uh to our panelists uh, collectively or individually and we'll, we'll speak together uh and then after about uh, 45 or 50 minutes we'll start engaging your questions uh from the audience uh that you'll ask through the q a function so um let's let's begin by taking a look at the most recent sort of pressing event um, Ragheda, you've written about the connection uh, between the uh, nuclear negotiations with uh, between Iran and the United States and the rest of the P5 plus one uh, and this uh, sudden flare up in between Israel and Gaza. And I was wondering if you and Hamas, really, I was wondering if you could um, give us sort of your take on that and then uh, get our, our see if any of our other panelists want to engage with this uh, so that we can effectively look at the news of the day and then put it aside and, and get back into the deeper questions. But I do think we can't sort of pretend this isn't happening or yes. pretend that it's unconnected. So let, let's start with you, since you've written about this directly. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it, Hossein. I appreciate uh, you hosting me and uh, referring to the column, which was uh, published yesterday in uh, the National mm -hmm. and on LinkedIn to different uh, versions because uh, anyway because one is shorter than the other right. but the point is that that you're making is the following uh, that you want me to talk about mm -hmm. do i see a connection between the negotiations in vienna and the flare-up in gaza and israel uh, mm -hmm. yes i do and here are the reasons uh, because in case the israelis decided to go in for a full uh, invasion of gaza uh, 
meaning that to really go in as a full invasion, not only strikes, I think it's going to change the balance of what's going on. I think at that point, it will be quite necessary for uh, uh, the, uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon to come in. And as far as Tehran is concerned, sure. I wouldn't even exclude the idea that maybe for the first time we might see the revolutionary guards engaging directly with uh, their, uh, their, their missiles against Iran in case, the, I repeat, in case Israel goes for a full-fledged invasion of Gaza to destroy Gaza completely, destroy Hamas completely. If that does not happen, it's a different scenario. If it does happen, that in connection with the Vienna talks is very strong because there you would have Iran coming in fully and, uh, and openly as a partner to Hamas in this engagement with Israel. Now, guess who's going to be on the spot in such a case? The Europeans can always play it here and there, uh, and they can just always say we're very afraid for ourselves because, you know, the nuclear for us is much more important than any Palestinian or probably Israeli for that matter. But I think President Joe Biden and his team would be very much on the spot because in that case, the choice that they have to make between Israel, the traditional ally of the United States of America, and Iran leading the Hamas fight uh, uh, with the Israelis. And we say Hamas, we don't say it's the Palestinians, all of them, because there is a distinction we'll talk about a little later. The Hamas, what the Hamas uh, missiles are, you know, uh, they, they, they are uh, very much backed by or coming from Iran. So Iran is engaging one way or another on the side of Hamas in this uh, uh, conflict. Therefore, Joe Biden, the president of the United States, will have to really think very deeply of what to do next. It's not a good position he's in. He's being put on the spot and it's going to be, it's now in impacting the negotiations. But for the moment, the priority remains for the Biden administration is to reach an accord with Iran. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. I mean, uh, I'd say my my strong guess is that that that, that won't happen. Uh, not necessarily that there wouldn't be any uh, ground action, but that um, I'd be surprised if it if the war really extended in the way that you suggest. But it could, it certainly could happen. I'm wondering if e either uh, Ali or Suzanne have any thoughts on this uh, before we um, get into the negotiations directly. Yeah, I would just that add. I think that is a very good analysis of what could happen. So far, what we're seeing is the talks in Vienna are progressing um, at the technical level and at the joint commission level. Uh, and it is a problem for Biden uh, as Hezbollah gets more involved. I'm sorry, Hamas gets more involved. But we have, a, we have a, another factor in here, and that is the political discussion here domestically in the United States. The narrative has changed quite dramatically. Um, we see free Palestine, uh, protests happening in every major city now. Uh, so it may not be as much pressure on uh, President Biden and his uh, administration as we think. This is a, uh, a very fluid situation. And I think the uh, narrative here in the United States is extremely fluid. Yeah. I think that's a great point. Ali, do you have any thoughts on this? Sure. Uh, first of all, Hussein, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be it's here. It's an honor and, to have uh, you. To be on a panel with Ragida and Suzanne. Um, so, uh, you know, I think there is no scenario uh, in which Iran would enter the fray in a conflict with Israel um, on behalf of Hamas. It's just very unlikely. I mean, the entire Iranian regional strategy of uh, forward defense policy, as the Iranians refer to, is to uh, deter uh, a, an attack on Iranian soil by using proxies and partners uh, away from Iranian border. And I doubt that Iran would, uh, would take any risk that would justify a, a direct Israeli attack uh, on Iranian soil. And that is bound for sure to derail the nuclear negotiations completely. Uh, so I if doubt- it happened, yeah. Yeah, so I doubt that is likely. But I think what this conflict is doing right now is that it's increasing the political cost for the Biden administration to offer Iran sanctions relief. You've already seen uh, members of Congress writing to the administration saying that sanctions relief is going to provide Iran with a windfall, that that windfall is then going to basically be channeled towards uh, Hamas and other groups in the region uh, to put pressure on Israel's. Um, I, I mean, we can argue whether that is a uh, an accurate uh, 
um, uh, uh, warning or, or not. Uh, but the reality is, at the end of the day, uh, this is just going to uh, increase the blowback that the Biden administration will face once it restores the JCPOA and offers Iran sanctions relief. That's a great point. I'd, I'd just like to throw out one uh, observation of my own, which is that uh, and opponents, categorical opponents of the JCPOA here in the United States have been trying to use the, the violence in, in between Israel and Hamas as, as an argument against re-engaging with Iran, as an argument against the negotiations themselves, in a way that <clears throat> strikes me as um, illogical. I mean, there's, there's no direct connection. Though there's violence in Gaza and Iran is connected to Hamas, therefore you shouldn't talk to Iran about nuclear negotiations. It makes no sense, but it's, it's a very concerted and I think a coordinated campaign, and it's it is bizarre, well, but you know it's spin. So sorry, Iran, go ahead. Yeah, but why? But why? Hussein? Why? Because why? because Hamas is acting for its own interests. Uh, it's That's not true. acting at the behest of, of Iran. It is a point to say that in addition to the nuclear negotiations, um, there's this question of of <laughs> Iran's uh, proxies' use of non-state militias that has to be addressed. But I think, you know, you can't throw everything into a bucket and stir it up. That's my view. All right. So let me, let me take this point up with you. If you think Hamas is, is acting solely on its own without any help from Turkey or help from Iran. Ah. I, yeah, I don't say help. I say yeah. at the behest of. Right. I think okay. they, they felt they needed to act and they were going to do it no matter what. Yeah. Let's not get stuck because, you know, let's not get stuck with, with dissecting that because it, there is an important differ differentiation. But mm -hmm. let me just say something here. Yeah. There is no way that Hamas is acting on behalf of the whole Palestinian Authority. Of course not. In fact, Hamas is uh, acting against, against the Palestinian it. Yeah, Authority. Absolutely. So let us be very clear on that. Yes, Therefore, for sure. if Sorry, okay, no, that's that's so with Zoom, when we speak on top of each other, then we uh, 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 then it goes right. uh, uh, okay. Give me two seconds and I will be quiet. But I will repeat Hamas is not acting on behalf of the Palestinian Authority, nor for the whole of the Palestinian. Uh, 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 of course, the Israelis were terribly aggressive and horribly ugly in what they've done in the uh, mosque in the Aqsa Mosque, and I think supporting the extremists amongst the I mean, all of the uh, uh, what is it, uh, settlers, mm. all of them are, are, have got to be held back, but especially the ones who are ex full of hatred, they really have been used also by the Israeli, part of the Israeli government, just like as Hamas is using its weapons uh, in order to, to accomplish its own goals. Who are the victims? Obviously the Palestinians. We will talk later about the victims being the Palestinians, not only in the West Bank and Gaza, but also the Palestinians, the Arab, the yes. Arabs who are living in Israel, in which Israel. I am afraid might be uh, might, might lead the Israeli government of Netanyahu uh, to use the uh, missiles, the Iranian missiles of Hamas, as a pretext to have a forced expulsion of the Arabs, the uh, Palestinians from Israel proper. We we'll get back to that. But, yeah. but you can't tell me that there is no connection with Iran because yeah. these missiles, 600 of them have been delivered recently yeah. by the Iranians to yeah. Hamas. Don't tell me that, uh, uh, that there is no uh, you know, connection uh, with, with, with Turkey because Turkey has been a great supporter yeah. particularly of the extremists of the Muslim Brotherhood in Hamas. Yeah. And I, I don't think Hamas uh, has, uh, you know, I'm sorry, there is a history for Hamas. Yeah. As we are told, I don't want to claim that I know the fact and I know that as a fact, although you can check it. But there's been a lot of collaboration and cooperation between Hamas and, and the Israeli Mossad on, on when, when it was needed. Right. So right. let I'll let you have the last word right on back. that. Let us, yeah. let us really not just consider this as right. if oh, it's okay. something is, is disconnected. There is a huge connection. I, under, I agree. Yeah. OK, so that's, that's all true. And that's an important point. I want to get back to Vienna. OK, so that, that's all fine. But, uh, you know, let's let's um, jump into our main topic, having, uh, you know, um, sort of necessarily tallied with the headlines for a second and good points you make. Yeah, I'd like to ask Suzanne, who's a, a real veteran of these conversations, uh, and then Ali and then uh, again, uh, Rahida, what are you hearing 
from Vienna. Where are we? It's, it looks like um, things are more, uh, in some ways, more advanced than some people had hoped, and in other ways, are uh, kind of bogged down. Uh, and if you can connect it to the politics, both in Iran and the United States, that would probably be helpful. Um, you know, give us your sense, uh, since you've been involved in this stuff, track to stuff for, for so long, it was really a, a tremendous experience you had. Thank you, Hussein. So uh, on the current state of play in Vienna, they've clearly moved into mm -hmm. their most challenging phase yet. As you said, progress has been made, but it's very slow going. Uh, I would say they're getting down to the nitty gritty of mm -hmm. drafting a document, which is always complex. All of the parties uh, continue to negotiate on the remaining areas of disagreement. Uh, they want to get back to compliance for compliance. Uh, what does that mean? For the Iranians, it means getting back to January 2017 in terms of sanctions, but this isn't likely. The Biden administration has said it will only lift and remove those sanctions inconsistent with the JCPOA. Some are legitimate, most are not legitimate, but there's been progress here. And for the Biden administration, they also would like to get back to January 2017 in terms of rolling back Iran's nuclear program. This also is not likely. In fact, I would say it's impossible because the Iranians have gained knowledge, the technical nuclear know-how that comes with advanced research. The centrifuges just, in particular, right? Yes. And that just can't be relinquished or wished away. I mean, the machinery can, but the knowledge in their brains cannot. So this, of course, means compromise on both sides in order to get to the finish line in Vienna. And I think both sides are experienced enough, they're savvy enough to know that. So there are some core concerns on both sides. Uh, the Iranians would like to see the U.S. dig a little deeper on sanctions relief. There's been progress here, particularly on the oil and banking sanctions, which are the key sets. But also I'm hearing uh, relief in other sectors like textiles, autos, shipping, insurance. Uh, so that's, that's a positive step. Um, on the US side, you mentioned the centrifuges. I think there are other sticking points relating maybe to uranium metal, the stockpiles and so forth. Um, but as they move to drafting the common text, I think a deal is still within reach. Uh, both sides are aiming to get their best terms I don't see the gaps as insurmountable. I see um, a key question is timing. And this is the timing of the deal. What is the Supreme Leader thinking? Is it better to reach this agreement before or after their upcoming presidential election on June 18th, which is now just heating up? Yeah. Um, the Supreme Leader would like to see high turnout. Mm -hmm. uh, reaching a deal would help produce that, but it would also move the momentum in favor of the moderates and reformists. Does he want that? And then let me just conclude on this point. This timing is also an issue for the Biden administration. They are facing a dilemma. They have distanced themselves from Trump's approach, including the Trump Pompeo sanctions in words, uh, but not in actions. They are clear that maximum pressure is a failure, but they're still enforcing Trump sanctions, many of which were issued in bad, bad faith to tie their hands um, in conducting diplomacy with the Iranians. How do you square that? How do you continue these sanctions, especially during a global pandemic right. that has Iranian citizens, has hit Iranian citizens especially hard? So this is, I think, the current state of play. It's complicated. Yeah, no, no, that was a really great summary. And I'm so glad you mentioned the word time because to me, uh, time is the governing metaphor in everything to do with the JCPOA. The JCPOA is a chronological gamble uh, on, on all sides. So there are so many aspects to uh, the question of time that we'll get into. But Ali, I'd like to ask you the same question. Where do you think the negotiations stand uh, with all the different aspects that I asked uh, Suzanne just now? Um, I think Suzanne uh, um, uh, depicted a very accurate image of where we are right now. Um, the reality is the fact that we're now working, both sides are working on a joint draft in and of itself is, I think, significant progress. But there are serious differences remain. In addition to the points that Suzanne make, made, uh, I would add that the uh, question of uh, verification of sanctions relief, which is extremely important for the Iranians, uh, I think is a major hurdle because... Uh, 
uh, unlike Iranian actions that could be verified by an independent referee, which is the International Atomic Energy Agency, mm -hmm. uh, there is no objective mechanism or referee for making sure Iran's banking and, and yeah. trade relations will go back to normal. And part of it also depends on uh, the Iranians basically getting their act together and, for instance, ratifying legislation related to FATF, uh, because Iran is the only country along with North Korea that is now blacklisted by uh, FATF. Uh, and it's hard to imagine that even if the U.S. lifts its sanctions, any primary bank would work with Iran. Yeah. Um, and uh, this might take time. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it is quite complicated. Um, but, but eventually, I agree that all of these disagreements are uh, surmountable. Uh, and the alternatives to restoring the deal is really, uh, are, are really not attractive for either side. Yeah. Uh, for the US, the continuation of Iran's nuclear program, the exponential growth of Iran's nuclear program that with, now with advanced centrifuges and 60% enrichment uh, is, a, is a real source of concern uh, for the Biden administration. And for the Iranians, continuing to live under US sanctions in the middle of the fourth wave of the pandemic is really uh, hard to tolerate. Uh, but uh, but having said this, I think, uh, Hussein, and I might have mentioned this to you before, that I, I, I do believe that the Supreme Leader does not want a major diplomatic breakthrough prior mm -hmm. to the elections. Yeah. It is true that he has traditionally seen uh, the turnout rate as uh, a, 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 a testament to the system's popular roots and legitimacy. But I think this time around, he cares more about the outcome uh, than the turnout. Uh, mm -hmm. in the sense that this is probably going to be his last president. And I think he wants someone who doesn't pose as many challenges to his authority as his, the previous four presidents who've served under him did. Uh, and, and this means that he wants a controlled uh, electoral process when usually you have high turnouts in Iran, you get surprised outcomes. Uh, and, uh, and this is why uh, a diplomatic breakthrough can mobilize uh, the uh, silent majority of Iranians to come out to the polls and, and could result in, in outcomes that the system does not like. Yeah. Last year, there was a parliamentary election in Iran in the gloom and doom of maximum pressure. Yeah. It produced the best outcome for the deep state. Uh, the hardliners uh, had a landslide victory in the yeah. lowest outcome, in the lowest turnout uh, in, in Iranian elections. And I think that's the model that they want to reproduce. Yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised that the negotiations would make incremental progress until June and then get uh, finalized uh, near or right after the Iranian elections. Uh, and the beauty of this for the deep state is uh, uh, the, that they can still blame the Rouhani administration for any shortcomings of the roadmap uh, uh, to, to re-enter the JCPOA. And Rouhani would still do the dirty work of rolling back Iran's nuclear program, which is not popular in Iran, dismantling centrifuges, shipping out uh, enriched material. Uh, and then the incoming president, who would be from the hardliner camp, uh, would be in a unique position. In the past four decades, I think no Iranian president has come to office with the prospect of significant economic growth yeah. thanks to sanctions relief. And so my guess is that we see slow progress until June and then rapid progress immediately after. So that way they would um, eschew all the blame and or much of the blame and take all the credit. And it's, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You did mention it to me and I shamelessly pilfered it and I appreciate it. Uh, Rahida, you have terrific sources, uh, really some of the best. And uh, so I'm wondering what your impression of where we are in Vienna and where we may be headed is. Look, I think I agree with what Suzanne said and Ali and, and no, the, 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 the jury is still out. Uh, the progress has been made, but it's not final. And I want to, I know you probably don't want me to harp on this, but I've got to tell you, you that can say anything you want. President Joe Biden is very much on the spot right now because of the developments in Gaza and yep. Israel. Why? Because there's two elements in these developments that are part uh, of the discussions that have been, actually these two elements have been pushed out of the discussions, the nuclear discussions. One is the issue of missiles. Yeah. Two is the issue of regional behavior of Iran. Now, both are on the table. Both are right now happening. Don't call it a right-wing conspiracy or any such thing because it's a fact. Mm -hmm. It is happening. Missiles are being shot and there are Iranian missiles. Mm -hmm. Iran is absolutely not hiding its own interest in supporting Hamas. Read them, hear them, talk to them. 
Definitely. And secondly, so the issue of missiles. And secondly, I think that the challenge to President Biden is probably bigger than to anybody else because what's happening is the uh, uh, it is that Tehran, maybe the hardliners are saying, prove it. You say that we are free to do, uh, well, let me rephrase this, prove it. You say that the priority is to be given only to the nuclear, and that is above all. So prove that you're going to get you know, serious about that and stick to it while the missiles are flying into Israel while the, uh, the regional behavior of Iran is under question, particularly if, if, if it flares up on the Lebanese borders through Hezbollah, then really everything is up in the air. Mm. You guys have got to, I mean, I understand the optimism and enthusiasm about having the nuclear deal. Like the Europeans, all they want is to speak about the nuclear deal, JCPOA and only that. The mistakes that were made by the Obama administration by agreeing to exclude any discussion and bow to the uh, Iranian demand that you do not discuss our regional behavior, whether it is in the ge Arab geography of, 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 uh, of, of, of Iraq, Yemen, Syria, Lebanon, or whether it is about missiles, the fact that the Obama administration bowed to that has cost dearly, including a massacre in Syria, including the absolute falling apart of Lebanon because it's under Hezbollah rule and, and that's it. And it's really not only Hezbollah rule, rule Hezbollah takes its, its orders, and they say so from Tehran, in particular the Revolutionary Guards. Well, so, what, so, what, so what regional behavior or what is it that the Obama administration that said that was done to be proud of when it comes on these two issues, the missiles and the regional behavior, that the Biden administration is sticking to? Because it is history repeating itself. The same team is coming and say to, the, to Tehran and the negotiators from Iran, you know what? Yeah, we really need that nuclear deal first. Hmm. We really, okay, we will negotiate that tradition, the, the gradual lifting of sanctions. We will compromise on this, we'll compromise on that. But no, you could have it. You don't want to discuss missiles? We'll put this till later. Do you hmm. want to not discuss regional behavior? We could also postpone that till later. And you know what? Let's just entertain a possibility, which I really just, it just occurred to me hmm. just right now. What if Netanyahu, decided to escalate in order to put these two, two, two issues on the table and force Biden to say, all right, now what do you do about it? What if now Iran and Israel, by accident, by coincidence, each for their own reasons, obliging President Joe Biden to just choose? Do you think, and, and, uh, and, and uh, Susanna said something very interesting. She said there's a lot of sympathy now amongst uh, the, you know, the public and maybe even the media towards the Palestinians. It's, it's about time. But Susanna, I hate to tell you, I'm an American like you, and I lived in the States for 42 years, and I still have my home there. Unfortunately, this is always a fleeting emotion. Something happens, and then Israel is automatically the favored uh, ally, no matter what. Mm -hmm. So really, it, this, this is going to impact the negotiations. Unless okay. magic happens, they wrap it up. Everybody goes to, to, you know, to back home and, and, and Netanyahu says, it's okay, I will let uh, uh, Hamas claim that it's victory or Hamas will say, well, that's okay. Uh, okay. Iran said the Vienna, Vienna negotiations are more All important. Right. Unless something magical like that happens, gotcha. I see problems coming up with the negotiations. Okay, let's pick, up, let's pick up on that, right? So you've put two long-standing criticisms of the whole JCPOA framework on the table. And let me add another one. Uh, and uh, let's see what um, the other panelists have to say about that, which is, yes, there's this existing uh, criticism about missiles and non-state actors, but there's also the question of timing. And I'd like to look at, at the question of timing because there's this very heavy lift being undertaken to resurrect the JCPOA, the terms of the JCPOA, that um, meant something different in 2015 than it does in 20, 2021 and 2022 in terms of the sunsets, right? In terms of the, the time frame, the timeline. And that's sort of uh, really my question, and, and I'll go to Suzanne first and then Ali. How much would it accomplish in and of itself 
I understand having a dialogue then can proliferate, but in and of itself, what would resurrecting the JCPOA, how much would it accomplish? And what about the problem of um, timing? We'll begin with you, Suzanne. Great, great set of questions, Hussein, thank you. So I think we need to inject a dose of reality into this discussion. And that is, you know, Iranians coming to the table to discuss these whole other set of issues. How likely is that to happen without reconstituting the JCPOA? I would say the chances are virtually nil. I mean, even in this set of discussions in Vienna, which are exclusively focused on the JCPOA, the Iranians are still refusing to meet the American negotiators, right? So, uh, and the reason they're refusing to do that is because they say uh, the Biden administration is not part of the Joint Commission. Uh, and they also don't wanna be seen as negotiating with the Biden team um, to their critics at home and their opponents at home. Mm. So this is a reality we cannot escape. But that being said, I do wanna um, th give credit to the Obama administration. Um, they focused on the most threatening part of the relationship with Iran, and that was the nuclear program. So I do think the Biden administration is right, placing the priority first on reviving the nuclear constraints on Iran's program. And let's be clear, the constraints put in place on the, by the IAEA are unprecedented. We need to get that back up and running and put Iran's nuclear program back in the box. Okay. Um, but I think the Biden administration should, and perhaps it is, also looking at the reconstitution of the JP, JCPOA as a potential strategic opening with Iran, the beginning, the entry point. So beyond this, uh, what else can they do? Um, they want to negotiate a longer and stronger deal to yeah. use the Biden administration's li lingo, follow up on the JCPOA and try to extend the so-called sunsets. Mm. Um, they also have placed the priority. Is that plausible to you? I mean, do you, do you think that's, yeah. It seems plausible as long as we understand, the United States understands that the Iranians are going to want something in return. Yes. And I think here we're edging into maybe primary sanctions. Uh, that mm. would be something that the Iranians would have their eye on. And that might uh, convince them to extend the JC, uh, the sunsets in the JCPOA. And at, at that at that point, though, if you get to primary sanctions, and I'll, I'll ask Ali also as well as Suzanne to 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 weigh in here, and then Ragada, of course, uh, yeah. you know, that then would lead us into the question of of non state actors as well as missiles. I mean, in other words, the closer you get to core concerns, then, then yeah. everybody brings up their core concerns, right, Suzanne? Yes, and then, uh, you yes. know, I think in the Biden team's mind, this would then set the stage for broader regional discussions to yeah. limit ballistic missiles, engage the UN and others right. in seeking a long-term regional gonna, security oh, yeah. structure around the G JC GCC countries in Iran and so forth. Yeah. So there's a okay. logic to quick, it. Sorry, a uh, quick response from Ragada and then we'll go to Ali. Yeah, if you permit me. Look, I, I, I appreciate the fear of the nuclear, of course, but just put yourself in a position that where you are from this part of the world, yeah. where you see the paramilitary forces mm -hmm. that report to Tehran, leaving uh, ha havoc, I mean, yeah. in, to, to the issue of sovereignty of countries. Look, look at yeah. the state of Iraq, the state of Syria, the state yeah. of Lebanon, yeah. okay. the, state, the state of Yemen. But the, right. uh, I want to tell you that I appreciate the preoccupation with the necessity of yes, the nuclear, but that is bowing to 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 uh, uh, to, to to Iran's uh, demands mm. and and uh, what do you call it? Tizaz in, in, in Arabic. I'm trying to find the right word. Uh, it, it's really blackmail yeah. that you don't do that. And you don't, yeah, and yeah. and so I want to just tell you, um, and and that's the primary sanctions. Mm. You know, it's happened before when they annulled the Obama administration and the other five permanent members, three, four permanent members plus mm -hmm. Germany, when they annulled, annulled Security Council resolutions that prevented Iran from, ex no. uh, from exporting its weapons yeah. and men to other parties, uh, to, to outside their own borders. That is when they contributed directly to the tragedy of Syria, to what happened in Iraq. 
to you know Iraq has been has been, the resources have been depleted by the right. revolution. Okay, I want to come I back. I want to make sure that uh, Jessica, yeah. we're I, not going to lose I, sight of it. No, I, yeah, I we won't to... lose sight of this issue. I, no, I, I we're going to return to it. That's all. I beg of you. No, it's it's an important point. We're gonna we're gonna come back to it at least one more time for a deep dive. But I want to bring Ali into the question. Uh, not, before we get into the, the, the non-state thing fully, which we will, uh, I still want to talk about the timing question, especially the problem. There are two timing issues that strike me as, as um, really important. The one that Suzanne and I were talking about sunsets, right? that means something very different now than they did six years ago, because you know we've eaten up half the time at least. So that, that raises a real question of how much you would really accomplish if, say, by the end of next year or the middle of next year, you re reset the clock to what looked reasonable in 2015. That's a bit different. The other question about timing is not just the Iranian election, but uh, Biden has only got another year or so uh, in which he can be sure he has you know, a clear field uh, because uh, things may look very different after the midterm. And uh, even then, you only get another year after that before the next presidential election. So timing is limited also on this side. But go ahead, Ali. What, what do you make of these um, problems? Thank you, Hussain. Let me just react quickly to uh, uh, what Raghada said about uh, the scope of negotiations. Uh, I do remember clearly that, uh, um, you know, the Iranians actually in 2012 wanted to include the regional issues in the negotiations with the P5 plus one. And there were uh, the Arab countries in the region who warned the U.S. against talking about the region behind their back while they were not at the table. And let's remember that the people. Let's, let's, let's table. Let's table this. No, I, I'm going to come back to it, and I'm going to begin with you, Raghida, and then we'll we'll do it. But let's table the non-state actors for a second. No, no, sure. Let, but let's go to the timing has, issue because, because otherwise we'll never get back to it. You know, the P5 plus one uh, is a uh, structure that is mandated by the Security Council to address one specific issue, and that's Iran's nuclear program. Its membership and its scope are determined by the Security Council resolution. And I think it's really uh, uh, one-sided to think that all the problems in the region have only one source, and Iran is the source of all evil, uh, in the region, and nobody else has contributed uh, to the current turmoil that we're seeing in the region, but that's a lengthy discussion that maybe I shouldn't get into. I mean, uh, we can. But... So on the question of sunsets... That's not what I asked you. <laughs> look, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the, I, I think... The, um, let me just, Hossein, add one more point, which I think is critical uh, uh, before I get to sunsets, which is that, um, you know, uh, I think the Biden administration has learned the lessons of the mistakes that both the Obama administration and the Trump administration committed. So the Obama administration, uh, I think, at best, wanted to prioritize the urgent over the important to uh, tackle the nuclear issue first, but really didn't have a plan for the day after to tackle other areas of disagreement, and it ran out of time. Um, uh, I think the Trump administration's approach, which was what Braghada seems to prefer, mm -hmm. which is to put everything on the table and resolve everything in one go, turned to be an abject failure. It exacerbated everything. It exacerbated Iran's nuclear program, Iran's regional behavior, uh, and so on, and Iran's missile program as well. But, but what about the timing question? So, so, yeah. so, so now I think the Biden administration is doing the right thing of actually trying to tackle these issues simultaneously and not sequentially in the sense that you see that the Biden administration is trying in addition to the nuclear issue to also de-escalate in Yemen and also support a regional dialogue process that would bring the temperature all together and address some of these issues that require regional solutions. You can't address Iran's missile program without addressing the regional balance of conventional weapons. Mm. So these have to be arms control negotiations at a regional level and the Biden administration I, I'm sure will pursue that approach. Okay, now, the sunsets, go ahead. There is, nowhere, sunsets, there is right. no way that the president would agree that Iran's nuclear program would grow exponentially in his, uh, the last year of his first term. It's impossible. So I think uh, there needs to be a follow-on agreement definitely before 2023. Now, if you frame this as the U.S. wants more, um, uh, if the Iranians are obviously going to reject that. But if you frame it as a better for better agreement, given the experience that the Iranians had with sanctions relief in 2016, that they were really unsatisfied with what they received, um, then you see a formula that could potentially work. 
Um, okay. The Iranians would make more nuclear concessions and the Biden administration can provide uh, more sanctions relief, especially primary sanctions, as Suzanne mentioned, that would actually allow the Iranians to reap the dividends that the JCPOA promised to them. Um, and, you know, there's also another element to look into this, which is the fact that the Iranians also know that this deal is unstable. Do you really think that they want a year and a half of economic opening before uh, either sanctions are snapped back or the next U.S. president in 2024 uh, decides to okay. bring on the agreement again? I don't think so. I think they also want to be able to count on their economic policies in the longer term. Right. This requires a follow on agreement. Point, point taken. OK, so here's then the question. Uh, and I, I do want to get back into the, you know, the, the, these other issues. But let me just begin, uh, and I want to, I want to ask. Actually, I want to ask Suzanne w- whether you think there's any. You know what? What are the really the chances of going beyond? What What are the chances of more for more? I think I'm I'm really skeptical about the prospect of more for more, uh, and the reason is that uh, the what you have to give to get back to the uh, original sunset framework seems to me uh, to set up a dynamic where extracting more becomes rather complicated. Is your question focused purely on nuclear or beyond? It's purely at the moment, because I'm about to broaden it again. Uh, Mm -hmm. But right now, yeah, I'm talking about sunsets and nuclear, and and then maybe theoretically those. But yeah, I'm thinking really about the sunsets and the the time frame. So let's imagine uh, the JCPOA is reconstituted, um, compromises made by both sides and the Vienna talks wrap wrap up either before the Iranian election or after. We can uh, quibble about the timing. Um, Then I do think the Biden administration working particularly with the Europeans will have to mount a very sustained focused effort on getting uh, talks back into the Joint Commission to think about more for more, precisely as Ali outlined. Now, keep in mind that the Iranians have a number of issues they want to discuss in the Joint Commission that could fall under more for more. First among them is um, the issue of, um, uh, I was gonna say reparations, but uh, all the economic um, gains that they lost over so these compensation. Last few years. I compensation, think compensation. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and I think they're going to want to have that conversation right away. Now, uh, do we imagine they're going to request pallets of cash being flown into Tehran by the billions? I don't think so. I think they're savvy enough to know that that's not going to fly. Yeah, but well. what they might seek instead are uh, direct investment opportunities, uh, Europeans coming in, having those sorts of um, economic focused uh, developments happen quickly. I think that's what they're going to want. So there is incentive on the Iranians part to continue the talks in the joint commission on issues like that. They may also want to discuss something called assurances, precisely because we might have a president Pompeo in 2024 Mm. or a president. (laughs) I mean, take your pick. One is as horrible as the next. (laughs) <laughs> that, that, that we would come out of the JCPOA again and what yeah. um, will happen. Okay. So there is incentive on the Iranian side to do this. And Point taken. If, you can, if you can accept that the Iranians have made a strategic political decision mm. not to pursue a nuclear weapons program, which I do, uh, then giving, uh, extending the sunsets are in the realm of possibility. Uh, right, so well, these are the sorts of things I think the Iranians would want to discuss. All right. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm still skeptical, but I'd like to go back to Ragada for a second, because I did. I, I wanted to sort of table the, the question that we got into before, but I want to resurrect it now, uh, because I do think we've, we've gone into the sunset and the timing issue quite well. Ali made a, a very interesting uh, claim or guess or whatever it was, <laughs> if you don't mind, uh, that the Biden administration has learned from the mistakes of the Obama administration, right? And also from uh, Trump's um, experiment. What do you make of that? I mean, do you see evidence of a, uh, of a learning curve here or no? I mean, what, what's your evaluation? Learned what? I don't understand even the statement itself. I don't understand even what's being said in that statement. Well, First, no, go ahead. 
No, well, first of all, I mean, I don't want to look. I mean, uh, uh, Hussein, you know me. I don't, I don't appear in in panels so that I don't engage in back and forth because I really uh, don't. I don't do that. But I'm just going to say to you what really upsets me about this sort of discourse. First of all, I want to apologize to Suzanne for calling her Jessica because I said I don't know why I did. Sorry about that. And I agree with most of the things you're saying, Susanna. I, 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 I disagree with the extent of your optimism, but I, uh, I, I agree with the extent of your hopefulness that things might happen. I would love more than anything else that there is a good deal going for mm -hmm. the region. I come from the region. I also am an American. Yeah. So, uh, so I wouldn't want anything more than a good understanding. Mm -hmm. But to exclude, to exclude from the conversation mm -hmm. uh, people from the region, whether it's in the Gulf or whether those who are under the mercy and under the foot of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, which are being applauded by some, probably including Ali, because I want to get back to Ali on this one. I, I don't appreciate that. I don't appreciate that it's okay to trample over sovereignty of other countries. Why? Because Iran needs to. Sorry. Paramilitary forces operating in sovereign countries reporting to a capital is an absolute violation of sovereignty. It should not be tolerated by anybody. Yeah, it's by gotta anybody. go, of course. So that's number one. So therefore the Biden administration should not push this for later to be discussed mm. later. It should put it on the table now. I am against the two-step mm. approach. We'll mm. deal with the nuclear now, and then we'll deal with the, with the, with the uh, okay. well, once we're done with that, and once we lose the leverage, then we we'll later on we talk about oh that regional behavior or the all those very dangerous missiles. It is not acceptable. This is wrong, and this is an insult. It's not enough to send a delegation right. as high. Well, do you want me to finish or not? Yes, I want you to finish. Okay, let me then finish. So I don't want a delegation to go to the region to just you know, palicate the, the leaders and say, you know what, it's okay, we're going to put you together later, we'll de deal with you later, you're still a good friend, because the region is falling apart. Yeah. Because there is an absolute you know, situation where I sit in Lebanon, this is a country going down in the ditch. It can't afford this you know, uh, paraphrasing of events. And I want to just say, yes, I am against this two-step approach because when you lose the leverage and then you give the money to the, to the people who are executing the foreign policy of Iran as far as everybody is concerned, includes, including the current foreign minister, and I am speaking of the Revolutionary Guards, yeah. then you are really enabling them to do the wrong thing that the United States of America should not stand for. We are supposed to stand for respect of sovereignty, not killing sovereignty, and then saying, oh, excuse right. me, I was really afraid of the nuclear. That gotcha. is that Europeans can do that because they're weak and meek. The United States of America should not be doing that. Okay. I beg that I beg that, that of the team of President Biden to pay attention because you know you've done it once. Don't do it again. Right. right now, there is a chance, especially of the, because Look. of the elections, to tell the Iranian people, to tell the Iranians who are going to choose their own president, please, it is not allowed that you go on trampling over other people's destiny and sovereignty. It is not okay. Right. Point made. All right, Suzanne, you uh, have a response or a point Yeah, I just yeah. wanted to clarify that the assessment mm -hmm. I'm presenting is not based on optimism by any right. stretch of the imagination. Diplomacy is hard and sticking with this course is going to be very difficult. Yeah. What I'm saying is based on my read of the interest of both Iran and the right. US. Um, so what I see is that, you know, after a delay, the Biden administration is very clear that rejoining and reconstituting the JCPOA is a US foreign policy priority. Right. Uh, there is an expectation of continuing diplomatic talks once, re once it's reconstituted. If we get there, we have appointed an envoy at, on Iran. We haven't seen this done in the case of Israel, Palestine, or North Korea, or other uh, crisis points. Um, and they're engaging in indirect talks now. Uh, the rhetoric is completely different. There is an emphasis on de escalation and dialogue. Mm. Um, and I do think, uh, you know, there's also indirect talks. We should bring this in 
on a prisoner exchange. Yeah. Um, they're not engaged directly in those discussions, but things are uh, appear to be um, inching forward That's there. That's sort of a confidence building step. Right? Yes, but my point is that uh, even though we're not back into the deal yet, yeah. the Biden administration has pivoted towards Iran, yeah. uh, towards uh, a different kind of relationship than, let's put it this way, the Trump administration had. Right. And on the point of regional dialogue, this, there's, there's a flurry of diplomacy happening now among players in the Middle East, uh, including the Saudi-Iran talks in Baghdad. Yeah. This indicate, you know, this tells me there's a realization on their part that the U.S. return to the deal is likely, and they need to prepare for that reality. Yeah, for sure. We've, yeah. we've seen the Biden administration um, strike a more strategic balance, shall, shall we say, towards the Saudis. Right. This is a positive development. I think the Biden administration understands that a lot of the problems we're talking about in the region cannot be solved by the United States. Yeah. It's the I, actors within the region themselves that have to get their act together and solve it. So we're seeing some any, reduction oh, sorry, in tensions sorry. there between Iran and GCC, right. leaving out Israel-Palestine, which I agree is a complicating factor. There's, there's a, I mean, I, I think it's obvious that all the players in the region, including Gulf Arabs and Israel and others, are, are bracing themselves for, um, you know, the resumption, the resurrection of the JCPOA, whatever that may imply for their uh, interests. You know, they are, I think the assumption is it's going to happen, right? The, here, let me just give voice to what I think the fear is. Um, the fear is that the uh, Biden administration believes that there is only one major American national security interest in the Middle East beyond the defense of Israel, which can defend itself with its nuclear weapons. And that is the Iranian nuclear issue. And the fear is that if they put it to bed in, a, in a, this little time frame of the JCPOA, you know, get it off the table for a few years that way, that they will then conclude that everything else is of minor importance for the United States and move on, and that that would be a terrible miscalculation. This is, this is I think, the fear of people who look at this policy and get uh, really concerned uh, that this is a sort of monomaniacal focus on the Iranian nuclear issue and, and that uh, there would be nothing of substance after that. And so I'd like to see what uh, Ali's response to that concern is, and maybe Suzanne also, and then we'll, we'll go to questions. Sure. Uh, so Hussein, first, let me say, I don't respond to ad hominem attacks, but you know, the, I, did, I was not defending yeah. uh, the Iranian regional policy. I was explaining it, which I think yeah. if you don't have a right understanding of it, then you obviously come up with wrong solutions. Uh, the reality is, uh, I think the Iranian interference in uh, affairs of other countries is as wrong as uh, U.S. deploying uh, uh, non-state actors in Syria sure. or the UAE deploying non-state actors in Libya and so on and so forth. I mean, Iran is not the only country that is engaged in this kind of behavior in the region. Right. Um, look, uh, you know, the, the reality is, I think Saudi Arabia and the UAE have learned the lessons also of the maximum pressure era. Uh, they realize that, uh, you know, if you engage in a zero sum dynamic with Iran, the US engages in a zero sum dynamic in, with Iran, they are going to be caught in the crossfire. Mm -hmm. uh, and the outcome is not necessarily going to be any better for them. But that is in contrast with the other fear that you were talking about, which I formulated yeah. in a different way. Yeah. Uh, and Raghada referred to this as well, which is that I've always believed that regional countries' primary fear is not of uranium enrichment, it's of Iranian enrichment. Um, and, you know, uh, I think all, that's What do you also, mean by enrichment? Uh, meaning Iran... Mean the empowerment of Iran, the regional... Iran government. getting access to more financial resources, yeah. okay. uh, projecting more uh, influence in the region. But again, I think that's a wrong way of looking at it. One has to understand uh, what is really driving Iran's regional policy, uh, one has to understand whether Iran has legitimate security concerns or not, and then come up with non-zero sum solutions. Uh, and, you know, the, I think the Biden administration uh, has a realistic uh, view yeah. of uh, the path forward. Mm. Imagine, let's just play it out. Let's just play out what Raghada is suggesting, that we say, okay, forget about the JCPOA. Let's negotiate 
a well I don't, I, she didn't say that, that. Didn't no you didn't that. no that's fair. fine so let, just give okay. us your point of view but yeah. you didn't you didn't well, endorse I'm, I'm iran's saying, foreign I'm policy there is there is no other realistic way forward other than okay. putting a lid on this exponentially growing nuclear mm-hmm. program which poses right. a threat to everyone and the biden administration wants to focus on great power competition. It wants to reduce its... And, uh, that's the fear. <laughs> ...in the region. Yeah. It is not able to do so unless it can yeah. resolve its issues with Iran and at least contain them. So that's exactly what I was talking about. So you've just, you've just sort of, sort of um, gotten into where the fear comes from. The fear is that the only obstacle coming from the Middle East to focus on great power competition is this concern about Iran's nuclear weapons. And then once that's dealt with, even in a kind of piecemeal way, in a time sensitive way, that, that the administration will feel that, you know, okay, it's, it's done and the region is no longer no, centrally saying, important. That's, that's, a, that's a that's real a concern. Frozen in 2015. Again, they, uh, you know, they assume that the Biden administration has not learned that instability in the region can spill over into the JCPOA and destabilize the agreement. So everything well, that they're sure they have learned that diplomatic investment, all the political price that this administration will pay for restoring the JCPOA will be lost in a few years, again, because of regional crises. OK, I've got to bring in the I've got to bring in the audience now and we'll we'll have plenty of time to, yeah. to revisit. Yes, and we will come back to you as soon as possible. But let me I mean, I've only got half an hour, so I've got to bring in the audience. Yeah. Let's uh, go to a live question from our uh, chairman, uh, Ambassador Frank Wisner. Uh, first, and he can ask his question on the air, and then we'll we'll go to the Q and A on uh, the Q and A function. Ambassador Wisner, please. Hussein, thank you uh, for letting me come in. Um, Ali, this is questions mainly directed at you. Uh, <clears throat> we're looking today at the prospect of uh, the outcome of an Iranian election bringing a harder line government to office. Think about that for a moment and think about the challenges before us to strengthen the nuclear arrangement, to deal with arms in the region and deal with the proxies. Hmm. If I thought of one element of Iran that is deeply involved in the creation of proxies, in the development of weapon systems, um, is the the, uh, more conservative, harder lined elements. Um, how do you see them dealing with the prospect of negotiations that would perforce limit uh, limit uh, the use of proxies, limit the reach of proxies, and limit arms? How much more difficult is that going to be with a hardline government, or do you see uh, flexibility on that side? Okay. Would you like me to answer now? Yes, yes, go okay. right, please, yes. Uh, thank you, Frank. That's a great question. Um, so I do believe that counterintuitively, a harder line president in Iran will help with negotiations on all of these difficult issues. And I explain why. Because I think the Iranian system would become much more monolithic. Uh, all instruments of power will be controlled by the same faction, the hardliners, the conservatives, whatever you want to call them. Uh, And so they will be less bugged down by the same elements that uh, basically paralyzed the the, uh, Rouhani administration's ability uh, to make further progress on these issues, which is the infighting uh, about who's going to reap the political dividends of dealing with the West. Uh, And number two uh, is the mistrust. Uh, I mean, you saw in the leak of uh, Zarif tape uh, that it's very obvious that uh, different elements of the Iranian system under the Rouhani administration did not trust one another, kept information from one another. Uh, I think this situation will change post-August because all power will be uh, basically in control of the same faction. And I think that would uh, facilitate negotiations as long as, again, the approach to the negotiations is not zero sum. And also uh, that we understand that unlike the nuclear issue in which the trade-off was between uh, Iranian uh, restrictions on its nuclear program and rigorous monitoring uh, in return for um, uh, economic incentives, if we're talking about issues that the Iranians see as core to their national security, which includes their ballistic missiles and regional policies, 
then the trade-off, the reciprocation, will have to come in the form of security concessions from the other side, not necessarily economic incentives. So this is where uh, what Rajeno was talking about starts to maybe feel like blackmail. Uh, because while it's true that uh, you know, many parties use uh, proxies and clients, Iran system of non-state, its network of non-state actors is really unique. And the way it undermines the, the sovereignty and the, and the state system in neighboring Arab countries doesn't have a parallel uh, in the Middle East anywhere. And, and I don't even think in the rest of the world anywhere. So it, it becomes, uh, if, if Iran requires security guarantees in order to not, you know, kind of demolish the state system in the neighborhood, that, that then starts to feel very coercive. Um, so I'm wondering if anybody has anything to add on that. Rakhida, go ahead. Yeah, I, first of all, I want to apologize uh, because we lost electricity, so I didn't hear the full question of uh, 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 Ambassador Frank Wiesner. Hello, Frank, how are you? And so I, I apologize, I heard only part of your question. It had to do with the Iranian election, the impact of the Iranian yeah. election. And that is actually a very good th thing to remember to talk about, because I think part of that, what we're threatened by, is to say, all right, you deliver... Uh, the Iranians are saying, you deliver what we want, then we can play that game that we can put, uh, you know, a soft face, a moderate face that we've done before with Khatemi, with Rouhani, uh, and we can, you know, put that moderate face on, on, on the, 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 the result of the elections. Uh, but if you don't, we're going to put uh, the real face of, of who governs in, in Iran and who runs the foreign policy in Iran, which is the uh, the 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 the, 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 the hardliners, the revolutionary guards, who are actually the ones negotiating in Vienna for our information to remember, if you don't mind. So that the, the factions is very clear. No, we know which faction is 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 in control, and we know what they want. And okay, I would love that there is an agreement on everything that's on the table. I would love Iran to be recognized as the great country that it is, that it is a great country with great people, but within its own borders, that it does not have to flex its muscles at the expense of the Syrians in Syria, the Lebanese in Lebanon, the, the, the Iraqis in Iraq. I mean, to, 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 to just say, otherwise we're gonna go ahead and, uh, uh, and, and scare you with our nuclear, that, that this part of the world, says to the West, go ahead, get scared. And especially the Europeans, stop selling us down the drain because you tell me we are scared of the nuclear. Stop mm. bowing to, 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 to these threats. I have a, a question from the audience for you, which goes directly to this point. May I, may I throw it into the mix? Okay. Uh, one of our audience, Patrick Theros actually wants to know if you would uh, suggest a return to the maximum pressure campaign of President Trump. We need that pressure, whether it is Trump's maximum pressure or any other pressure. But you can't just always look like you're, you know, you're, you're, you're bowing to the demands of the hardliners in Iran without keeping any of the tools for, you know, a comeback. So then, you know what, they, 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 they back down from saying full lifting of sanctions, but you don't touch us. By the way, Ali made a very big mistake by saying, oh, the Iranians wanted to, uh, in the beginning, they, they wanted to, ah. to discuss everything on, uh, put all the regional issues on the table. He's absolutely right. It was at the very, very beginning of the talks. And then they realized, oh, dear God, no. And then they fought, you know, to and nail to make sure and demand and stipulate that there will be no discussion of Iran's regional role and its, mm -hmm. uh, and, and its project in the Arab geography mm -hmm. or, or Middle East altogether. That's so that's extremely good. interesting. Let, let's not make a mistake on okay. this one. Let, let me ask you, because Suzanne has a... maximum pressure sure. is important. Yeah. I am not, I'm not advocating that we go back to... And because okay. I know the United States right now, you say Trump, people want to faint. Okay. That's, that's not the point. The point is that yeah. you do not give up leverage. When yeah. you're negotiating, you do not give up all the leverage and then you just say, ah, now I will negotiate okay. and I will give you, you know, everything you need by excluding what I want to discuss and responding to what well, you demand. Point taken. Uh, Suzanne, we've, we've heard from Ali, we've heard from Raida about this question of, of uh, a period of time where Iran may have been interested in a more holistic conversation about all of its policies. What can you tell us about that? 
Well, I think the Iranians have made it very clear that they're not going to discuss uh, the region uh, unless and until the JCPOA is up and running. <clears throat> and the reason they don't want to do that is because they feel uh, that the United States reneged on an agreement. They know they did. This was an agreement enshrined in a UN Security Council resolution and supported by the international community. Um, but they have made it clear in private discussions that once the deal is up and running, uh, they will have more of an inkling to get into expansive dialogue. Uh, is it guaranteed? No, but it's something that we need to pursue. And I think we have to be realistic about this. Uh, if the deal is reconstituted, uh, it's not going to be Rob Malley and uh, Abbas Aragchi meeting in some capital to discuss Yemen. The Iranians are going to want to work through multilateral frameworks. Uh, so Yemen worked through the UN uh, to hopefully reach a political settlement there. Uh, there are also, this is a point of discussion between the Iranians and the Saudis now. Uh, so I think, again, I want to inject a dose, a healthy dose of uh, uh, reality into this conversation. Um, reality is welcome. Have, what you have described as coercion, yes, you, you're free to use that word. But for me, as a um, practitioner of diplomacy, hmm. negotiator, I'm interested in moving the ball forward. Yeah. How do we get to point A to point B? And right. I think the the approach the Biden administration is pursuing now is the way to do that. Let's be clear, with the JCPOA, we've had a very rare occurrence. Major powers plus key related actors came together on the nuclear issue. They agreed that was the most important. Best to tackle it as a priority and move on to other issues. They did this uh, through peaceful means, uh, not through military action. So I think this multilateral approach to Iran that uh, the Biden administration is also looking to reconstitute is most productive, most constructive. On the issue of Trump, uh, Trump's maximum pressure, well, let's be clear, it failed on so many fronts, but one thing that it's not talked about enough is how he ended that hard won consensus, that multilateral consensus uh, on Iran that existed um, and when we saw that stunt in the UN Security Council last summer on snapback, mm. uh, I mean, it was an embarrassment. It, it was. further damaged our standing. So I think, let, you know, let's be realistic on our leverage, the best yeah. way forward. Uh, my own feeling is we actually yeah. have more leverage when we're back in the JCPOA because the Iranians know that even if we're in, unless the United States administration is telling the Europeans and other investors it's safe to go back into Iran. It's safe to have business dealings, mm. engage in economic um, uh, deals. It's not going to happen. Okay. Uh, that's big that's... leverage to me. Okay. Rahida? One quick word. Uh, you are a practitioner of diplomacy, and I respect that. And you're saying, how do we go from step, you know, to, to, from one step to another? Why is it so difficult to demand of Iran the respect of the sovereignty of other neighbors? Why is that such a tough thing for the United States practitioners of diplomacy or otherwise? Why is it such a difficult thing? That's the only exception in the world where a country demands respect and recognition for its so-called right. To, to, to abuse the sovereignty of other countries and have paramilitary forces there reporting to it. I think you're misunderstanding yeah, what I'm saying. Yeah. I am not good. saying that the two yeah. are most mutually yeah. exclusive. Well, hold on, hold on. In fact, yeah. my point yeah. is hold that- This is how you hold use on. from one Wait, place- folks. This is how you use from okay. one place to another, Suzanne. No, no, no. You Hang on, no, no, let's, let's have a conversation. Okay, saying so I really, a, this is- Hold on, wait, This is a charge that I must respond to. Wait a second, yes. I am not saying- do that, I am not charging. Hold on a second, folks. Wait a second. Look, control this conversation, you see. Yes, we have a question, which is a fair question, which is, uh, you know, um, how is it reasonable for Iran to take this position and for the United States not to confront it in a very direct way and put it forward as a major concern? So, um, you know, I'd like to hear from both Ali yes. and Suzanne what they think. So, about it. it's, it's a very you good know, I, 
This is very important. I have never made the statement right. that we should not be confronting Iran. In fact, we should be incessantly. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, pursuing a no, revival no. of the JCPOA and confronting Iran on these activities that mm -hmm. undermine U.S. interests and the interests of others in the region uh, are not mutually exclusive. My only point is what is the best, most realistic way to do that? And when we came out of the JCPOA, President Trump severed the uh, one reliable channel of official engagement that we had with Tehran. And that was the Joint Commission. Um, it severed, it was a, a good working channel, not only on nuclear issues, but we've learned that also regional issues were discussed through that channel. We've learned that that channel helped to deal with crisis management in the region. So what I'm saying is we need to get something like that up and running and build on it. Yes, it will be hard, but I think that is really the only way forward. And um, again, multilateral, we need to put together that consensus on Iran once again with the Europeans and others uh, to work together on these issues. So um, what I have in mind is something that is uh, much stronger than anything Trump was able, or Trump and Pompeo were able to put together. What they did was actually uh, blow up that consensus. Mm -hmm. They undermined our interests. They undermined the interests of our partners in the region too. Right. Uh, make let's, no mistake um, about it, it was a failure. Um, let's bring in Ali here because we haven't heard from him for a while. And I'm just curious, um, again, I, you know, we, we could kind of be accused maybe of, of uh, you know, a kind of obsessive focus on this issue, but this is the Arab Gulf States Institute. So it makes sense that the non-state actors is something that, I don't know, uh, it, it takes a great deal of our attention. Ali? Sure. Uh, look, Hussein, this um, discussion reminds me of the discussion about uh, terrorism. Uh, sure. What's the best way of addressing terrorism? To kill terrorists or to address the root causes of terrorism? And, and this is, uh, I think, why we have to understand why Iran uses proxies and partners in the region, why Iran insists uh, that its uh, ballistic missile program is, is, is non-negotiable. Uh, and again, you look at the root cause and you realize that if you put yourself in the shoes of Iranians, again, I'm not defending them, I'm trying to explain how they see the world, is that they feel that they're surrounded by the United States, which is not inaccurate. Uh, you know, we have 40,000 troops off their shores in the Persian Gulf every single day. Uh, in addition to other bases around uh, Iran. Uh, from a conventional military perspective, a country like the UAE's Air Force can destroy the Iranian Air Force in matters of hours. Iranian Air Force dates back from the time of the Shah. The Saudis have longer, term, longer range ballistic missiles than the Iranians. The Israelis have not just nuclear weapons, but also longer range uh, ballistic missiles. So when we uh, impose an arms embargo on Iran and then ask them, to uh, disarm from what they see as critical to national security, obviously this is a non-starter uh, uh, argument. I, I don't see how this is not obvious uh, to people with uh, a little bit of uh, common sense. I mean, at the end of the day, if we're looking for Iran to make a compromise on what it sees as critical to their national security, then we should allow them to- So friend, here's, uh, here's the, there is a, a certain- technology. Well, hold, hold on, Raghada, I'm gonna, gonna come to you. Raghada, I'm gonna come to you in a second. But I want to make I want to make one quick point. There is a there is a, a, a bit of a cognitive dissonance here in the sense that um, we're sort of um, being very understanding about why Iran would want leverage, uh, and then uh, being very skeptical about why the United States. You know, sort of there's there's this uh, sense that U.S. leverage through sanctions doesn't make sense for the United States and is self defeating. Uh, but Iran's leverage through the non-state uh, actors does make sense for Iran and is understandable. I, I think that that I just wanted to point out that is sort no, of not working no, for no. me. Uh, go ahead, Ali, and then I'm going to come to you. Rahul. Look, I'm I'm yeah. saying the core bargain of the nuclear deal. Oh, I understand. Made, made yeah. sense because yeah. the nuclear issue, sure. at least at least since 2003, no. No. was not critical to Iran's national security. I, I understand that. No, you you were not unclear. Right? Your answer was very clear. Um, what I'm simply suggesting is that in the conversation, there's there's a you know, certain 
uh, imbalance that's come up in my view. But anyway, let's no, let's. What, what Rahira, I'm you you seem very keen. Okay, Ali, this, go ahead, and then we'll go to Ali. We can't continue selling billions of dollars of sophisticated mm -hmm. arms to Iranian neighbors and then say, oh, why is Iran oh, developing these ballistic oh, missile programs? Excuse me, wait. No, wait I understand that. Why is that right? If you're going to have an arms control, undermine international it. norms by invading other countries, by doing well, some of the same things that the Iranians are doing, including supporting non-state actors, and just turn it around and blame the Iranians for doing the same thing. Well, there is, I, yeah, I mean, it's not here. comparable, but go ahead, Rahida. Yeah, I mean, I would appreciate it, Ali, if you say that you are defending the Iranian regime, because then it's clearer and we are to the well, point. Don't say you're explaining it, and it's your right. Uh, yeah. It's your absolute right. I mean, I think he yeah, can but, define but, his but, own. Let me finish, let me finish. All right. First of all, first of all, you know, the, the, the U.S. presence in the Gulf, all of a sudden that, uh, that uh, Ali is equating Iran's right to go and uh, into, uh, into Iraq and Syria and Yemen and, Le Le and, and Lebanon and others is to stand up to the Americans in the Gulf, uh, which is, is at least in principle, if the UAE or Saudi Arabia or Qatar want to invite the US or Oman for that matter, or Kuwait, if they want to invite the US presence in the Gulf, it is a sovereign right. They're not inviting militias of the United States. All right, so it is a big difference between sending your militias in a proxy war or inviting a country. And even you could argue with me, I, do, I don't appreciate the, when, the, when the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, Syrians say or the Russians say that the Russians are in Syria upon the invitation of the government of Syria. I don't appreciate it, but they're right. I accept that this is the notion. This is, as much as I dislike it, it is a fact. So to tell me that the, 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 the explanation of the logic of sending militias, training them, arming them, and sending them to other countries is because the United States is present in the Gulf, I don't think this is a very solid government uh, uh, argument. Okay. I think you should really take another All right, look at let's, that. no, I appreciate that intervention. Let me, let me throw out another question, which, which comes from uh, Oded Meyer. It's, it's kind of interesting. It's very basic, but it, it probably ought to be thrown. I'll start with Suzanne. Um, he asks whether um, not having, uh, having no deal is better than having a bad deal. That's, that's just a theoretical question. It's an interesting one. As a practitioner, right? I ask him, you know. Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah. Um, you know, I when I'm out talking about this set of issues, that question usually comes up. And um, I find it very um, non-compelling, if I might say. I think it's a false choice. Uh, we've learned what life is like without a nuclear deal with Iran. We've lived it since May 2018. And what did we see during that period? You know, the Trump administration pursued a very draconian approach to sanctions. They didn't really offer a serious off-ramp for diplomacy. Um, and what did we get? Iran's nuclear program expanded by leaps and bounds. They're now uh, enriching uranium at 63%. Um, their activities in the region also expanded. Uh, we went to the brink of war with Iran over the killing of Qasem Soleimani and the tit for tat and escalation that ensued. Um, and there's another thing that I'd like to bring up is that during the time we were in the deal and we were living up to our um, commitments as the Iranians were, and keep in mind, the IAEA consistently confirmed that the Iranian uh, nuclear program was in compliance throughout that whole period. We also had the added benefit of what I would argue is a little predictability in terms of Iranian uh, foreign policy. Um, that now no longer exists. And we've been on a path of escalation ever since. So another other, an undercurrent I'm hearing in this discussion uh, is saying is that Syria? there I mean, is a, a favoring that, of, wait, I'm not finished. Let me finish. But we'll, um, come to you. You. we'll come to you immediately after. <laughs> no, so, no, let's, let's let Suzanne finish. I just have one on. more point. Rahira, let's let Suzanne um, finish and then you'll have earned, ample time an, to respond. An undercurrent to this discussion is that um, the sanctions are leveraged that should not be lifted. 
And I have a real serious problem with that. I think sanctions should be viewed as the means to reach an end goal, usually a change in policy. And uh, if we cannot even agree on that, then I don't think um, we can agree on much. And I do think that's where the Trump administration made a serious mis mistake. It okay, left no room to lift those sanctions. And that's what I'm hearing in parts of this discussion, that we should maintain those sanctions no matter what. Um, I think that's a recipe for failure. I, I All think right. we should maintain the sanctions. I think we should maintain the sanctions until Iran takes it seriously, takes seriously its commitment to the non-nuclear state, until it takes seriously its commitment to deal with the uh, uh, with, with the issue of of, of uh, Missiles, but above all, and I know this matters little to people sitting in the United States, until it makes a commitment that it will not go on really, really killing the sovereignty and the ambitions of people who are in, in, in independent, allegedly independent sovereign states. I'd like to invite you to, 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 to come to this part of the world and see if things have changed or not. Go to Syria, go to Iraq, go to Yemen, go to Lebanon and see why wouldn't, it, it puzzles me, it kills me that people who are talking about diplomacy and, and, and the right thing to do, don't want to see that. It just makes me crazy. It makes me crazy that, uh, uh, for example, Ali speaks about the, the U.S. presence, military presence in the region, sitting in Washington probably, and he forgets that there was a China pact signed with Iran for 25 years with everything, you know, in, included weapons and what have you. It is very important that, you know, at least the value of some of the sanctions by the Trump administration, and I'm not going to sit here defending Trump, because as I said, this is toxic. You are. You're defending Trump, whether you oh, like it or not. Oh no, no, no! I, I, I this, do. No, no, okay, all right. And I like right. it. You're defending I've, his had, policy. We've had I'm enough. No, I, I, I really I think. Look, wait. I, I want to put a ground rule. Hold on. I am not. I am Hang on not a second. I am, I, there's a there's a ground rule I'd like to understand. Exactly hold exactly on a second. This is hold not a to say that I'm defending a policy of Trump that I find correct. Fine. This exactly. Is nothing, nothing is wrong with that. Yeah, so no, don't, no. don't start to box it's people. Fine. Look, look everyone, so far now, all, everyone has characterized everyone else's uh, views as me, X, Y, and Z. Let's, let's agree to let everybody speak for themselves, right? Uh, I don't hear Rangeda defending Trump. I don't hear Ali defending the Iranian regime. I don't hear Suzanne uh, defending Obama. I don't, that's not what I'm hearing. What I'm hearing is differing perspectives, all of which have merit. And I think we just need to understand, you know, take that in as our basic starting point. Um, let me ask, there's a question which comes out of left field from uh, one of our audience, and I'd like to throw it out, which is, is really interesting. Uh, it's from Jim Dingman. Uh, he asks, um, does the unraveling of Afghanistan impact these considerations for the United States or Iran? And I think that is really, uh, you know, something that doesn't come up very much, but it's, it's very significant. Um, Ali, you're nodding your head. You want to uh, chime in here and then we'll see what others think? Yeah, sure. I mean, look, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, these are issues that over the years, Iranians and Americans have actually agreed upon. Uh, there's been a lot of common interest in having stability in both of these countries. Even there's been tactical differences, but all in all, the strategic uh, uh, alignment, I would say, between Tehran and Washington in these cases has, has, have been clear. Now, I also think, uh, you know, the reason the Iran issue is a gateway issue for the Biden administration is that it's hard to really imagine stabilizing Afghanistan uh, while Iran is under maximum pressure and is lashing out. Uh, same applies to Iraq, same applies to Yemen, same applies to Lebanon. Uh, and then when it gets to the Iran issue, the JCPOA is the gateway issue. But this, again, does not mean that we should overlook uh, or neglect other uh, issues. But once we can stabilize the JCPOA, put a lid on Iran's nuclear program, prove once again that the U.S. is a reliable negotiating partner, it doesn't renege on its commitments and constantly move the goalposts, then we have a better chance of negotiating with the Iranians. Uh, and again, if, if our approach is... Uh, non-zero sum, I think we really stand a chance of finally bringing about much more stability to the region writ large. Okay, Suzanne, go right ahead. And Just then a we'll quick continue. point on Afghanistan. 
you know, when Biden announced our withdrawal from Afghanistan, military withdrawal, uh, the team signaled um, support for developing regional dialogue uh, around Afghanistan to bring stability to it. And as uh, a key neighbor, Iran has to be part of that discussion in order for it to succeed. So there was a meeting uh, that was supposed to be co-convened by the UN, Qatar, and Turkey to be held in Istanbul. It was postponed and hopefully that will get up and running. The Iranians have indicated that they would participate and the Americans would participate. That could become a venue uh, for um, beginning some nascent cooperation or coordination on stabilizing Afghanistan. Um, So I do think this is another dimension of getting back into the deal. It does open up these possibilities. Are these possibilities definitely going to happen? No, no one is saying that. Again, they will have to be pursued, pursued vigorously. But the JCPOA is an entry point to having those conversations. Okay, uh, we are at 11.27. So I'm going to uh, ask Rahida to answer this question. And uh, close us out. So you have the the last word, and uh, we'll just, be done. Is there any other question? Because I think this was already answered. Uh, okay. No, well, I'll just ask you if you have any closing comments. And uh, you know, uh, we heard from Ali. We've heard from Suzanne. Yeah. So let's, let's hear from you, and then uh, maybe quick quick words from yeah. the other two, yeah, and we'll I, be done. Yeah, I, I just want to say that uh, you know the news of the meetings between the Iranians and uh, the Saudis, the confirmation of these meetings in Iraq came during my interview with the president of Iraq last week on uh, Beirut Institute Summit's e-policy yeah. circles, which are held every other Wednesday. So, and then I dug in and tried to find out if something is going on. And I know there's a goodwill on both sides to discuss these matters. Um, and let's just remember that there is not, you know, again, it's not in any country, I mean, in, even in the United States, you've got the Democrats, you've got the Republicans, you've got the hatred and, and, and the divisions within the U.S. that I've never seen like they are right now. It's like, you know, right. everybody's accusing the other, which is really disturbing. But the point is that, yes, the region is trying, for example, to look after itself and have a conversation. You have the uh, Turks and, uh, and, and, and the Egyptians are talking. You have... Uh, uh, yeah, it's, things are the, the bit of a conversation is going on, but the policy of the United States remains very important. Right now, you have the Russians trying to make sure to put the hold to 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 cement the control of Syria. If there is U.S. American very four, what is it, four five thousand, whatever it is, that they are there. Yes, as an American, I'd like them to stay there till I, we don't lose Syria completely to the Russians and the Iranians and. The, 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 the Hezbollah, because mm. I respect the sovereignty of Syria and I don't want it to be only in the hands of the Americans or of the uh, Russians. The same thing goes, in, the, in my conversation with the Iraqi president, the one thing that he spoke about continuously, and I wish people who are practitioners of diplomacy pay attention, was the issue of how do we achieve sovereignty? How do we regain our own you know, control of our own lives, having rather than being pawns in the others' considerations in the geopolitical game or as proxies. And I really want to say that I sit in this country called Lebanon, and I really want to tell you that the price being paid by this country for these proxies, mm. not, not even a proxy, for the principle of allowing any country to control any other country through paramilitary forces is a destruction of the country. So I just really wish my American friends will start to think that it's not only about the nuclear, you know, it's, it's actually insulting for us that you just think it's all about the nuclear. This is about our sovereignty and about the future of our children, about living here in dignity instead of just telling me, oh, it's justified because the nuclear is what scares us. For that, I say goodbye and thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Now let's go to Ali uh, for your final thoughts on any aspect you want to address. Look, I, I, I would just say that the same mindset that has put us, the region, and I'm from the region, in this uh, situation Uh, is not going to uh, extract us from it uh, and even put the region in a better place. As long as we continue to have these kind of very one-sided analysis of what's happening in the region and put all the blame on one side or another and only pursue 
pressure and coercion as the, as the way of getting us to our objectives, uh, you know, uh, we've seen the pattern in the past four decades that would just continue. Uh, we need a different change, uh, a, a different narrative and a different discourse. Uh, and I'm pretty confident that if the Biden administration succeeds in restoring the JCPOA, uh, they've taken the first step in the right direction to achieve that objective. Okay, great. Uh, Suzanne, final thoughts? Thank you, Hussein. I'd like Thank to you. end on a positive note and uh, give the Biden administration some credit of not only pursuing uh, restoration of the JCPOA, um, but also they are no longer standing in the way of regional dialogue. Uh, the previous administration did. Uh, when there was interest either on the part of Tehran or Saudis to have a regional dialogue, the Trump administration made it very clear that shouldn't happen. Um, those days are now over. How long uh, we'll be in this period is a given, is not a given. I mean, we don't know. So we need to make as much progress as possible uh, in case uh, things uh, go bad here. And we have another president that takes us out of all of our agreements, that reneges on all of our commitments. Mm -hmm. We need to make progress very quickly. So this is a very positive development. The U.S. is not going to be the convener of this regional dialogue. We cannot and should not do it. But we now are actively encouraging the powers in the region to get together and solve their own differences among themselves. And we will be a supportive partner. That's yes. positive. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you, Ali. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Raghida. Um, this has been a very spirited conversation, and I appreciate that. Uh, thanks for your patience. Um, and the audience, thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you again uh, for another uh, of these uh, AGSIW webinars uh, with another great panel. Thank you very much.